family was there, Black region, one of you who are gathered. Let's offer a word of prayer, shall we? Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. It is the day that you have made. We will rejoice. We will be glad in it. We bless you for all that you are to us, and we thank you for all that you do for us. Now, as we prepare our hearts and our minds to study your word, I pray that you would open them to that which you would have us to receive today. Speak to our hearts and then help us to process your word and then apply it to our lives that we might be blessed through it. You promised us that if we would abide with you and your word would abide in us, we could ask what you will and it would be done unto us. So we lay claim to that promise now and we make it ours in the precious name of Jesus. Bless the furtherance of this study together. And we will just thank you for this means in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right now, Minister Brian George is going to favor us with a selection. And then I'll be back. For the most part, we do very well in how we relate to each other 
and how we treat each other. But there is always room for improvement unless or until we become perfect spiritual beings residing in these bodies of flesh, we still have some work to do. Our goal is to strive for growth and for perfection or maturity. That is what the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews encouraged his readers to do in Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2, where he wrote, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and the, re the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. It is, it's, it's time for us to move beyond the foundational truths. We're not moving away from them. We are merely pursuing perfection in our spiritual lives. Paul, the apostle, was also a proponent of pursuing spiritual perfection. In fact, the way he expressed it to the Philippians also speaks to us. Listen to what he wrote in Philippians 3, 13 through 17. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which also, which walk so as ye have uh, us for and in sample. Now let me get that to you in the New Living Translation where I'm sure it's going to make a lot more sense to our 21st century ears. It says, no dear brethren, brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. So what is advocated by the apostle is that we grow in grace and relationship with God and with each other, we should be mindful of two things. We should strive for the goal of maturity or completion, and also we should be mindful that we don't fall back into old patterns. But as we learn better, we should practice to do better. And it is a concern of mine, uh, as it was a concern of Paul's, that we do not fall back into old patterns as these lessons and even these series build one upon the other. We must continue to refer back to them so that we can live forward. If we thoughtfully Consider these sessions as we delve continually deeper in the exploration of relationships with God and with each other. 
the need for renewing the mind becomes crystal clear. Not only must we renew our minds where God is concerned, we need to renew our minds where our brothers and sisters are concerned as well. Now, let me get away from Bible speak to real talk. When we speak of renewing the mind, we're talking about changing the way we think. It is as simple as that. We sometimes have to change the way we think. As a matter of fact, this is essential as we grow in God. The closer we get to him, the more our thought process will naturally change. But this is also imperative as we learn to relate and to get along with each other. Sometimes we have to change the way we think about our brothers and sisters. We have to move from some spiritual sibling rivalry to sibling rapport. When my natural brothers and sisters and I were growing up, we would often hear our mother say, usually after some sort of sibling dust up, you don't have anything but each other. We have to come to the realization that the same is true of us in this world. The devil is against us. The world is against us. In this world, we have only each other for support and for encouragement. And take it from one who has lost three siblings to death. You can never have too many brothers and sisters. Now, while we have been placed in the worldwide church, the universal body of Christ, we have also been born into a local fellowship. Local fellowships or churches or congregations are like family units. Because we are, then we should treat each other as family. This is why Paul admonished the local church at Rome with the words that form the foundation for this series. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. He uses two terms uh, uh, as he talks about how we relate to each other. He uses the Greek term philostogoi, which speaks of genuine loving affection. And he uses the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. The love of someone who was born from the same mother. So uh, he speaks of a closeness that local fellowship should have. He speaks of a love that should be spread in a local fellowship like a family unit. Now, in this session though, I want to explore the implications of the latter portion of our theme verse, Romans 12, 10. I believe that what Paul has written there is vital as we consider how we are to comport ourselves with each other. Bearing that in mind, I want to talk today about valuing each other. About valuing each other. Paul wrote, Te time alus pro egumenoi. Be devoted to one another uh, in brotherly love and then honor one another above yourselves or in honor, preferring one another. That term, in honor, preferring one another. Te time alus pro egumenoi. Understand, this is different than the way the world thinks. The world says, look out for number one. This is what I've heard since the time I was a child. Look out for number one. 
But the church needs to understand the implications of that statement. It tends toward self-interest and selfishness, which is decidedly not characteristic of Christ and should not be a trait of his church. We have to fight the tendency uh, within ourselves to be selfish, to be self-oriented, to look out for our own self-interest so that God can bring out the best in us. Now, as we consider the implications of mutual respect, I want to add another verse of scripture to help us do in our fellowship what Paul instructed the Romans to do in their fellowship. I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, to Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3. Paul wrote, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, let me give you the New Living Translation of Philippians 2, verse 3, and then I'm going to add verse 4. It reads, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. This is where we need to bring ourselves to. But I want to break down uh, the latter portion of Romans 12 and 10, and I also want to break down a couple of important words in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3, so that we understand exactly what we need to be doing and where we are headed. The word honor in Romans 12 and 10 comes from the Greek word tine. It means to esteem to the highest degree, to value as something precious. So when it says to honor one another, it means to value uh, them as precious, to esteem one another to the highest degree. Now, there's another word there in Romans 12 and 10, and that is the word preferring. The Greek is proegumenoi, and it means to go before and lead. But in the context of Romans 12 and 10, it speaks of taking the lead in showing deference one to another. So, that means you don't wait until someone shows you deference, but you take the lead in honoring, in esteeming, in preferring your brother or your sister before you. Now, let me move into Philippians 2 and 3. You see the word esteem on your study sheet, and you see its Greek counterpart, hegumenoi. This means to command the mind. Notice, to command the mind, to suppose, to consider, to deem. But I love the first definition, to command the mind. Sometimes we have to tell ourselves what we need to do. Now, we esteem others as better. Who were a contest? Uh, this is to hold above. Uh, metaphorically, it is to esteem someone as superior or as surpassing. Now, as we look at these words, as we perform this word study, we have to conclude that the performance of the commandments of Paul in Romans 12 and 10 and in Philippians 2 and 3 begin with the way we think. That's why we have to 
change sometimes the way we think. When it comes to our brothers and sisters, we may need to change the way we consider them, the way that we think about them. And one of the ways we need to really start doing it is instead of finding fault in our brothers and sisters, search for virtue. Remember, our job is to build each other up, not tear one another down. That's our job, building one another up. And we do this first by building the person up in their own esteem. This is why it says in honor, preferring one another, taking the lead in showing deference, esteeming one another as equals or better than yourself. Now, in order to do this, I think sometimes we need to go back to baseline and consider the supreme example. I said earlier that we are endeavoring to put theory into practice so that we can do those things that are required of us as we grow in our relationships with God. One of the best ways to begin is to look at the supreme example of what we should be and of what we should do. I'm speaking, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I want to invite you to turn to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John because there uh, we see Jesus showing deference and showing esteem to his counterparts, the disciples. At verse 1 it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now remember who we are talking about. This is Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. This is Jesus who, according to the scripture, came from God and was on his way back to God. This is Jesus the Christ. And what does he do? After service is over, after the dinner is over, he takes a towel, girds himself, pours water into a basin, and begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now shortly, they're going to be on their way out of the upper room. But before they leave, he washes their feet. To get an explanation of what is going on, we drop down to verse number 12 of this third chapter of John. And here we see, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I did, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. I think I better go to the New Living Translation 
so that we can wrap our 21st century minds around what Jesus just said. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I find it curious that in the church today, people will quite easily wash feet, but often have no clue as to the lesson that Jesus was teaching his disciples when he washed their feet. We concentrate on the action without taking time to understand the motive behind it. Jesus was teaching them the value of honoring others of your group and being willing to serve them. I also find it interesting that the water, the basin, and the towel were there when Jesus and the twelve arrived in the upper room. No one went to get it. It was already there. But no one used it when they came in the room. It was customary to wash feet when you came into a home. If the homeowner was rich, a servant would do it. Sometimes even the homeowner would do it himself. In any case, if no one was there to wash a guest's feet, then the guest did it himself. But on that night, no one washed anyone's feet before Jesus washed all of their feet. I find that really interesting. They didn't even do for themselves, much less for the others. Now let me show you what was really going on. I want to look at the context in which Jesus took that basin of water and uh, that towel. Remember, in John 13 and 2, supper was over. But let's look at a portion of the dinner conversation. Turn to Luke 22. Beginning at verse number 47, it says, I'm sorry, verse 24, it says, And there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. Y'all got that? You shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. Now all the while that Jesus is talking, there is a pitcher of water, a basin, and a towel. Listen to what he says. For whether it is great, he that sitteth at me, or he that serve, is it not he that sitteth at me? But I am among you, as he that serve. While there is no doubt who the greatest among them was, he esteemed them highly, and he honored his disciples by doing for them what they would not even do for themselves, much less for him or the other disciples. Even as he's teaching 
they are not picking up the lesson until he tells them, after doing it himself, what he has done. Now, I've been sharing with you in this lesson that in order for us to get to where we need to go and perfect our relationships with God and with each other, there has to be a change in the way that we think. There has to be a renewing of our mind. And as I move on toward the close of this lesson, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Renewal of the mind, the changing of the way we think will result in a change in the way we look at ourselves and we conduct ourselves. If you look at point number three, it makes the statement, the way up is down. If you want to go up, the way to ascension is down. As we grow in relationship with God and in the grace of God, we will come to understand that the way to be held in high esteem is to honor and esteem others. Again, we need only consider our supreme example. I want you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul to the Philippian Fellowship. And I want to share those words from the New Living Translation, Philippians 2, beginning at verse number 5. Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Uh, the King James Version, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He wasn't talking about the thought process. He was talking about the attitude. What attitude are we talking about? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Oh my God. Did you hear that? He's God. But now, as he takes on the form of flesh, he did not think that equality with God was something to cling to. Theologians call this whole concept uh, kenosis, a self-emptying. He's getting rid of everything like God. He's ending himself of it. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Are you catching this? This is the one who was God, but who did not think of equality with God as something to hold on to, to cling to, but instead he gave up divine right, divine privileges, and took on the position of a slave, put on human form, humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on the cross. And what happens because he humbled himself, took himself down. What happened? Verse 9, therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself and God exalted him. I'm trying to tell you that humility is the way to go when we stop thinking of ourselves as all that and although we may not know 
rejected, often we do think of ourselves as all that, even when we may not be that at all, we think of ourselves as all that. But the attitude has to change. In order to see your brother, your sister's value, sometimes you have to devalue yourself. Take a real look at yourself in the mirror. Take a real look at your life and who you are. Look at your imperfections. Not just what you have going on, but what you don't have going on. And then perhaps you can see something else in the lives of your brothers and sisters. But let's go ahead and, and hear the conclusion of the whole matter. First of all, it is a matter of attitude. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Again, the New Living Translation. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirits, are your hearts tender and compassionate, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. That's the attitude that we have to develop. And here is the action plan to help us develop the attitude. It is found in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The New International Version says, young men, in the same way be submissive to those who are older. All of you Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The plan is to clothe yourself with humility. Now, to clothe ourselves with humility seems to indicate that it is not necessarily a part of our nature. So, we have to put it on, and we have to continually put on humility until it becomes second nature. It is only when we humble ourselves that we can truly value each other. So, it starts here. It starts with renewal of the mind. It starts with a change in the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about our brothers and sisters. But dear hearts, we need to be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and in honor, esteeming or preferring one another. Hope you got it, hope you received it, and I hope that you will work on humbling yourselves and exalting your brothers and sisters. Ryan's coming back with the song, and then I'll be back to take your questions if you have.
Tonight, but we have one from last week. We have one from last week, and that was. It was from Brother Goodlow. And Brother he. Goodlow. And he asked the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to wait for it to come up. He said, when I think of the goodness of God and what he has done in my life, I cry from my heart, what kind of love is that? Okay, I'm not sure if that's an interjection or a question, but if it is indeed a question, um, the answer is a simple answer. It is a combination of the love of which uh, God consists, that is agape, and then the action of that love, philos, as a father loves his child and provides for his child, blesses, cares for his child. That's the kind of love that you're talking about. All right. Thank you so much. Glad you tuned in. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that we have received tonight. Help us to apply it to our lives, to use it in our day-to-day -day interactions with each other, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Continue to bless us all in the midst of this pandemic. Protect us. Watch over us. Keep us in your care and in your blessing. Until we meet again, Father, I pray that you bless us all. I ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Remember, parking lot praise and worship this Sunday at 11 in our parking lot. The lot opens at 1030. We are looking forward to seeing you there, joining with you as we worship and bless this great God whom we serve. And until then, keep looking up. Thank you.